Hi, this is Phil Chandler, and today I'm doing a bit of maintenance work in the apiary, so one of my apiaries. So um, this gives me an opportunity to talk about a couple of things that might be of interest to, uh, particularly to uh, top bar hive beekeepers. Um, I've got a, a variety of uh, top bars here, which I want to talk about in a minute. So as you can see, this hive has no floor in it at the moment. Uh, that's because I am going to fit a, here we are, underneath, um, is the, is the uh, plastic guttering which is going to go in as an eco floor and that's going to have um, various things in it, sawdust and wood shavings, which I'll talk about in, in another video, in fact. Um, this particular video I want to talk about uh, the woodwork and the fittings. Um, so there's one thing I'll point out straight away. This hive has a hinge roof, as you can see. Um, which is, a, I think, a great advantage. I think having a hinge roof is, is, is really good as long as your hinges are up to the job and as long as the screws that hold your hinges on are up to the job because it doesn't take much um, for a roof that is quite heavy like this one to uh, flip over and, uh, and, and break and that's what, exactly what's happened to this, uh, this particular roof. Now, the person who built it, who shall remain nameless, um, did not use very large screws. As you can see, these are fiddling little um, wood screws and they're also not stainless. They're not in any way proofed against corrosion. So they're already rusty. This hive is only, uh, I don't think it's been used yet. I think it's, it was made about two years ago. Um, so it hasn't been used and yet the screws are already rusty and the hinges are already rusty because they're not stainless steel, which they should be. Um, stainless steel or brass are the only things that really should be used on outdoor uh, equipment like this. And um, also, these screws aren't long enough to take the weight of the roof. So they have literally split the wood here, so I'm going to have to glue this piece back in, use some longer screws, um, to fix the problem, all right? This block here is what, ha what the back of the roof rests on. If you can see that, as I, as I open the roof, it rests on that block. Now, that's, that's an okay arrangement. It's not great, um, I think, because it, uh, even with that block there, there's a certain amount of leverage against the edge of that block which could potentially rip the hinges out. So uh, I much prefer to have a chain stay on this lid, and that's what I'm going to fit here. I haven't got the chain with me, but I'm going to fit chain stays on this roof as an extra precaution against it blowing off. And I think that's something that would be worth bearing in mind and would be worth incorporating if you use hinge roofs. You'll also notice that this, um, this roof has a built-in slope, as it were. Here we are. Here's the slope. Uh, in this particular case, it slopes towards me. Um, this is the side, obviously, that I'm going to be opening when I'm inspecting the bees. Um, the slope could just as easily, to be honest, be the other way. It's not really important which way it is, as long as it's got a slope. Why do you want a slope, Phil, you may ask? Um, well, I guess the obvious thing is so that water runs off. And then the next thing you probably say is, well, I've never actually seen water make a pile. Um, but I think a slope roof is a good idea. It sheds water quickly. This particular roof is made of phenolic ply, which is a coated plywood. And um, it's pretty good uh, at shedding water. I don't know how long it's going to last, but it's not showing any real signs of deterioration um, other than the... Um, the, the sort of expected UV deterioration, which happens to pretty much everything that's outside. Um, I've just given it a coat of paint, or recently given it a coat of paint, so you can't really see the, the level of de deterioration. But if I put the camera a bit closer, you can probably see these fine cracks appearing in the surface, uh, which, you know, is inevitably going to lead to some water insurgents at some point. So keep it painted would be my advice on that. So the main thing I want to talk about right now is um, the preparation of the interior surface of the, of the wood. And you can see 
uh, that it's dark and I'll tell you why in a second and I also want to talk about the design of top bars themselves which I think will be um, useful to people who are starting off with top bar hives. So um, this wood as you can see has been scorched with a blow lamp. Why would I do that? Well um, it's a Japanese technique um, called Shusugi Ban which is uh, used in Japan mostly on cedar wood and this is Douglas fir by the way just in case you were wondering and um, what they do is to scorch the surface of the, of the timber to render it uh, as into a uh, how should we say to make it waterproof so that water runs off it and you can try this yourself if you um, if you light a blow lamp and scorch some wood and then uh, run water over it you'll find that um, it actually repels water rather well the um, the scorching technique is pretty straightforward I'm, I'm, I'm demonstrating now with a with a blow lamp and if I hold the blow lamp just for a short time close to the wood you can see obviously it burns well there's no great surprise there the degree to which you burn it is entirely up to you um, I've taken a fairly light um, approach on this one I haven't scorched it too too much you can go um, a little bit stronger because in fact the um, for some reason which I haven't really fathomed out yet um, even if you burn it quite quite uh, strongly as it were quite make it quite dark um, sunlight um, not that the inside of the hive is going to get sun on it but sunlight on the exterior um, does actually fade it I can show you over here this hive was scorched uh, with a blow lamp in exactly the same way and you can see that uh, a year or two in the Sun has pretty much bleached it again uh, and also uh, while we're here I can show you yes this is what happens to phenolic ply um, a couple of years in the sun all right so good idea to paint it anyway back to our other hive and so why do I do this well the one thing that the bees will do uh, in this hive is to um, they want to make the inside of it somewhat water resistant they don't want to be living in um, a hive that is essentially wet wood so they will try do their best to put a layer of propolis over this over the surfaces over the sides in order to allow um, condensed water to run cleanly away and not to soak into the wood every hive I've come across where bees have been exposed to raw uh, untreated wood or uncoated wood should we say um, they do in fact coat it with propolis over time so we know that they want to do that there may be other reasons, in fact there almost certainly are other reasons why they do that with propolis and as I discussed in another video um, one of the main purposes of, of them using propolis is to make their hive resistant to airborne pathogens particularly bacteria and viruses that are floating around everywhere and yeasts of course so if we can help them along a little bit by preparing the wood now of course you can use um, you could use a varnish I mean I have used in the past I have used um, shellac for example which is a, a varnish made by dissolving a substance which is quite similar to propolis uh, made by the lac beetle which lives in uh, Burma and Thailand and places like that um, so the lac beetle makes makes this 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 kind of slightly it's, it's harder than a wax it's a it's a hard um, br almost brittle substance and if you've used French polish then you've used shellac. shellac uh, French polish is shellac dissolved in uh, alcohol so isop isopropyl or um, methylated spirits whatever you like but it has to be a, a strong alcohol maybe even 100 percent I'm not sure so you can do that um, the problem with shellac is that it's not entirely waterproof um, it's it's used as you know if you've done French polishing uh, French polish is an interior finish not an exterior finish so it's okay it helps but it's not great it's not it's not ideal uh, for, for, for the interior of a hive so um, I have also mixed propolis with the shellac to, to create a more kind of you know bee friendly um, or, or should we say bee, fr bee familiar environment um, but I think this idea of scorching the wood like this is a viable alternative and it's something that you might consider um, you could also oil it. In fact, the, the traditional finish in Japan 
is finished with with tongue oil, T U N G oil, uh, which you can buy in hardware stores, and um, you could finish it with that. I wouldn't suggest you use tongue oil on the inside of the hive. It's got a smell to it. Bees might not like it. Don't know, but you know, on the exter on the exterior, if you want a nice, smart-looking hive, tongue oil is the one to go for. So, let's talk about top bars. This is um, an old top bar that, that I made years ago, and it's a, the simplest possible top bar, really. It's just a piece of timber. Uh, this happens to be 17 inches long because that's the width of a standard UK national um, top, uh, top of a frame, so the top bar of a frame. Um, the thickness of the wood is about three quarters of an inch or what is that 22 20 22 two millimeters something like that and the width of it this way is 38 millimeters or one and a half inches in old money um, and this is a di dimension that I have personally found to be the most satisfactory um, I've, I've used various widths and experimented with different widths of, of top bar 38 millimeters, one and a half inches is the one I've settled on. Doesn't mean necessarily it's the ideal one for you. But if you're using bees like mine, which are sort of near native uh, British um, um, native uh, black bees, um, Apis mellifera mellifera or thereabouts, um, then they may well suit. It does seem to be very good uh, at preventing cross combing, this particular dimension. Don't ask me why. So. This, when I say this is simple, this had a single saw cut along the length of the bar. And I trickled a, a line of wax in the saw cut. And as you can see from the, the pattern here, made by the bees, they made a nice straight comb on that bar. All was absolutely perfect. And um, as you can see, they, they, that one worked very nicely. And, it, and you can see the propolis along the edge here where they've, um, where they've added that. Now, that won't necessarily always be the case. I have made, I made a number of these bars years ago. Um, sometimes they built nice straight combs. Sometimes they wandered off and made mm, somewhat creative uh, curvy patterns. So if you want to keep your, um, your combs reasonably straight, and I suggest you do because if you don't do that, then you're going to be in trouble when it comes time to inspect them. And um, if you happen to have a visit from a bee inspector, then they will be best pleased if they can go through your hive, comb by comb, check everything's okay, put it all back together again nicely. They don't want to destroy um, colonies any more than we do. So, um, you know, it's your, it's your, it's your um, opportunity to, uh, to impress your bee inspector by having nice, nice straight combs. Um, whether you impress the bees or not is another matter altogether. They, they take quite a lot of impressing, um, I found. Anyway, so let's move on. Here's the next, if you like, the next stage in development, um, which is actually perfectly viable. It's a piece of half round dowel. If I hold it sideways, you can see the cross section is roughly half uh, semi, um, semi cylindrical, isn't quite the right word, but you know what I mean. It's half round and it's just pinned in place along the center of the bar. Uh, that works very well. Uh, any guidance like this that you give the bees, they tend to follow. You can see the traces of wax on here. They've made a nice straight comb on there. All good. Um, the, here's a couple more here which are similar. This one has um, a quadrant nailed to it. Not very well nailed. It's split both ends. And this one has a square section uh, piece of wood nailed to it. Uh, which is actually a better job. Either of those work very well. They work just as well as the half round dowel, pretty much. Um, and you can experiment with variations of this and see which one be works best for you. Uh, these two bars are, as you may observe, a couple of inches longer than the, um, the standard bars because these are designed for Langstroth hives. So they're 19 inches long instead of 17 inches long. Otherwise, identical. Let's put those over there. And this is the pattern that I now use as my standard. As you can see, it's a triangular section. I'm actually going to grab another one. Um, this one I've, I've uh, done the blow lamp thing on um, for similar reasons that I did it on the interior. But, you know, that's something you can do or, or not as you choose. Um, the main thing to notice here is you've got a triangular section, which 
gives you a ridge for the bees to, to, to operate from, to draw their comb from, and because the uh, ridge is the lowest part of the bar when it's turned up the right way, if you can see that, then obviously that's where they're going to build their comb, and so you're actually using gravity a bit to guide them. And this works very, very well. I very rarely get cross combing with this pattern. The other thing worth mentioning, perhaps, is that um, the ends of the bar on this pattern are uh, thinner uh, in in this in the in in this direction. Uh, they're about uh, what 10 millimeters or so. So the reason for that is well, there's two reasons. One is so that you can put these bars into a standard hive, which I'll show you in a moment. The other is that when you put it on the hive like this, it can only move thus far. Now, okay, this hive has got these, um, it's got these side pieces on it to stop the bars sliding off anyway, but with that uh, rebate there, it does help you when you're putting a hive, when you're setting a hive up, um, not to have bars kind of falling off um, and uh, landing in the bottom of the hive. In case of any doubt, some people um, aren't quite clear on the use of top bars in terms of their spacing. Um, you don't have spacing with top bars. They go side by side. The whole point of them is that you uh, make them such that they, as far as possible, prevent uh, too much air leakage out of the hive between the bars. And for that reason, you always put insulation on top of the bars. This hive has bees in it, it's had bees in it all winter and as you can see I've used a couple of tatty old polyester pillows on top of the um, bars to provide insulation. You must always have insulation above the bars, I think that's absolutely a golden rule because there inevitably will be a certain amount of air leakage between the bars which the Bees will do their best to plug with propolis, but you can help them a great deal by actually adding insulation above the bars. So I really suggest you do that. I mentioned that the cutaways at the end of the bar uh, have another use, which is to enable you to put them directly into a standard hive. This is a polynuke. Because of these uh, shaped ends, you can drop these bars directly into a standard hive alongside frames and you will find that they sit nicely down in the hive they don't hold the roof off or anything like that and it enables you to transfer bees onto top bars inside uh, a standard frame very very easily and i thoroughly recommend that as a practice um, i'll just demonstrate to you while we've got this uh, frame here so there's 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 a top bar in my right hand here's the standard frame this is a uk national frame obviously and you can see how the two things match up together uh, same length um, i use these white spacers which actually happen to be um, nearest diameter 38 millimeters they're about actually about 37 and a half millimeters i measured them um, but close enough so in fact my frames are, are actually spaced the same as my top bars um, if you use Hoffman spacing which is the uh, which these frames aren't um, Hoffman spacing I expect you know has the the little raised bits on the on the sides of the frames so the, the frames become self spacing that's called Hoffman spacing those tend to be around 36 millimeters rather than 38 so um, that's uh, that's stop bars that's the way i like to have top bars um, these work very very well recommend them if you want to use this uh, either of these patterns by all means go ahead um, obviously the difficulty with these triangular sections is that they have to be cut uh, on a on a table saw and if you don't have a table saw then it's much easier just to take um, you know a sort of strip of wood like this nail a guide to it job done just as good really um, but I do like my triangular bars okay that's probably all I need to say about top bars themselves right now there'll be more videos on setting up the hive for swarms and so forth and there'll be a lot more management videos being made as the season goes on it's now uh, towards the end of March so um, as we go through the season I'll be making a lot more 
um, particularly top bar hive videos and others as well we'll see and thanks for watching if you have been and uh, do the usual things below subscribe and click the little bell thing and all those bits and like it if you like it please that would be great thanks very much and i'll see you in the next video